All right. Thanks so much for joining us today, everybody. You are here for the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance's Get Legit webinar on the Nevada County Cannabis Ordinance. Um, for those of you who don't are not familiar with me, my name is Maggie Phillipsborn. I am the Director of Membership and Education here at the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance. We are a nonprofit asso trade association uh, whose mission is to provide advocacy, education, and opportunities for connection uh, to support a thriving local cannabis industry. Um, our values are steeped in economic development. Hold that thought. Uh, environmental stewardship and craft cannabis. Um, we focus on policy both locally as well as statewide. Um, and we provide year round education to support permitting compliance and small business development. Um, I want to make a few quick announcements before we get started today. Um, one, our Get Legit Education series is not made, uh, is in part made possible due to the wonderful support of some of our business sponsors. Um, please support those who support the industry. I want to give a quick shout out to Ag Natural, Four Seasons Garden Supply, uh, Foresters Co-op, and Humboldt Seed Company. Thank you so much for your support. Um, and I also want to let everybody know that the Get Legit Education Series has been ongoing for many years um, and is very robust. All of our uh, webinars are recorded and available online if you go to www.nccannabisalliance.org, which is in the chat here. Um, you, there is a Get Legit tab, and you can find all of our upcoming webinars, all of our past webinar recordings. Um, we have a full YouTube playlist, and it is very robust and informative. Please take advantage of this resource. Um, our next webinar after today is on April 6th, and it is on workplace safety and compliance. Um, we have a presenter from the Department of Industrial Relations. They will be going over Cal OSHA requirements, pesticide safety, and all sorts of things, workplace safety, um, enforcement triggers on this, and so forth. So really important information. Um, April 6th, you can register online just as you did for tonight's webinar. Um, and again, this today will be recorded. Um, it will be available in the coming week or so. Um, we want to hear from all of you if there are additional subjects that you are interested, um, that you need continuing education on, please reach out to us. We are here to support. Um, you can reach us at info at nccannabisalliance.org. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, you can call our office and check out our website. Um, before we get started today, our executive director, Diana, has a few notes. Hi, everybody. Uh, Diana Gamzon here. I'm the executive director for the Nevada County Cannabis Alliance. And I just really want to uh, express my appreciation to county staff, um, both our county staff that's here today and our board of supervisors leadership um, for working with us for the past two years uh, on the change that you're going to be presented with today. Um, these changes come as a direct result of the feedback that we got from all of you, um, members of the cannabis industry, as to the needs as our industry shifts so much, what, what, what changes have we needed here locally? Um, so items like we'll be discussing today, on-farm vertical integration, allowing for distribution on the farm, non-volatile manufacturing, um, opportunities for tourism with that the micro-business retail, the winery model, um, as well as reasonable canopy expansion. Um, and yeah, so thank you to all the members who participated in that advocacy and provided feedback. Um, we are also really excited about what uh, uh, is gonna be coming in this upcoming year related to the equity program that staff will talk about today. In 2019, we began the advocacy uh, to lobby to ensure that we had a, a local equity program here. And while it's a lengthy process, because you first have to do an equity assessment and that takes a year, uh, we finally are getting our uh, equity grant dollars this year, which is gonna be just a huge lifeline to so many of our farmers. Currently, what we're working on is um, re-reviewing our local tax structure. And so we're working with county staff and Tina Vernon, our tax collector, on, re on reviewing our, our tax um, uh, uh, rates. 
Um, and then continued opportunities for tourism this upcoming year. So cannabis events. And the future is the, the, the future is is bright. We have a very special industry here and just really expressing gratitude for county staff for continuing to work with the industry. Um, Nevada County, or sorry, uh, the cannabis industry um, has been noted uh, during our board workshop as one of our key industries, and we are listed. We are um, under uh, the Economic Development Board Board of Supervisors objective, so we are directly linked um, and noted as an economic driver here in the community. At a statewide level, we're working with our government affairs um, industry partner, um, Origins Council, on. Um, reforms related to simplifying regulations, such as um, removing the back, uh, tagging every plant. Um, and we're supporting various bills this upcoming year that will help uh, small farmers. So thank you all for the members that are on this call and thank you all for your support of our local industry. And if you're not a member, you can find out more information online at our website, nccannabisalliance.org. So for tonight's webinar, um, you will see there is a Q&A feature as well as the chat feature. Um, please feel free to utilize those throughout the presentation. There will be ample time. We will make sure we get to everybody's questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but you can write out your questions as you come to. Um, and we are just uh, very grateful to have Thomas Maoli and Jason Bissaw here from the Nevada County Cannabis Division. Um, and I will hand it off to the two of you. Thank you so much. Great, thanks Maggie. Um, yeah, my name is Thomas Miley. I'm with Nevada County Cannabis Alliance, uh, or excuse me, Cannabis Compliance. Um, and I'm here with Jason Besaw, my um, team member here, coworker who's all things cannabis also. So uh, what we wanna do today is one, you know, we're appreciative of everybody showing up working with Alliance and, um, you know, support and encouragement to get these uh, ordinance updates that we want to um, go over and also the encouragement to go after the equity grants and the DCC grant. So, um, you know, big changes for our program in the last, you know, year. Um, seems recent, but we've been working on it for a while, quite some time, but um, everybody working together, the communication, the teamwork, um, this isn't done by the county alone. It's done um, in support of everybody out there in the alliance. So we appreciate it. Uh, what you're going to see today is kind of, I'm looking through the, the chat. I'm seeing names of attendees. I appreciate a lot of first year, you know, the original members um, and uh, applicants are here. I appreciate you guys showing up. So you may see some of these slides. They're going to be modified, something you're used to, but um, it's going to have some updates in it. So if there is a question you have, you can throw it in the chat. If it's dire and you think we're moving on and you need to ask it, feel free. But if you can, hold it till the end. And um, we're looking forward to like a vigorous conversation on um, this. This is all new. This is like, this is bringing like our compliance division back to like two, two, three years ago, right? This is like, this is new and exciting and fresh. So, um, you know, our board of supervisors, uh, you know, adopted this ordinance or supporting cannabis, everything in this ordinance was to make life easier and uh, our cultivators more um, competitive, right? That was our goal. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Jason. Um, he's going to run through uh, the changes to the new ordinance and um, we'll come back. We'll talk about questions you have. We'll talk about the grant and um, how we can assist you guys. Uh, Go ahead, Jay. All right, great. Uh, like Thomas said, my name is Jason Besaw. Uh, been with the division there since we started in 2018. And this presentation, again, it'll look familiar to some of you. Um, if you have a, a burning question, need to get it out, feel free to, but if we can save them to the end. Um, and with this ordinance just recently going into effect, um, we can't think of every possible scenario. I know a lot of our cultivators can and you're going to have those individual questions some of it we just may not have uh come across yet but we'll get through this presentation and then we'll we'll do the best we can to answer those questions so i'll be sharing my screen
And so hopefully you can all see that. And so I'm just gonna scroll right through here. And so these are all our staff uh, department contacts. So when you're dealing with uh, cannabis compliance or trying to get a cultivation permit, it's not just cannabis compliance. You're dealing with almost the entirety of the community development agency. Um, of course, all this contact information is available through um, Nevada County CA.gov. So the agenda, this is um, short compared to our, our how to, because um, we're just going to be focusing more so on the changes um, from the most recent ordinance. So we'll be doing the cannabis ordinance overview. Um, the highlights will be in red. We're going to talk a little bit about the ADP, the administrative development permit uh, process, some, some middle items, and then amendments. Um, one thing I don't have on here is we'll go a little bit over um, changes to canopy as well, because that's a significant part of the changes. And so for this ordinance overview, like I said, the changes are going to be highlighted in red. So it's not just medical um, use anymore. It's adult use. So the zoning has remained the same. You still have to have ag, ag exclusive or uh, forest zoned properties. Um, nothing has changed with the two to 4.99 acre uh, indoor only. It's still the 500 square feet of canopy, 450 support area. Uh, moving into the five to 9.99 acres, this is where we're going to start seeing changes where uh, it's still the 2,500 square feet of canopy, the 2,250 square feet of support. But now you can use up to 55% of that support area for canopy. So the math there to the right in red, you can use an additional 1,237.5 square feet of your support area for canopy. Um, I'll go into a little bit more detail further on about what that what that actually means. So the 10 to 19.99 acres, 5,000 square feet of canopy, 4,500 square feet support area, but you can use 2,475 square feet of that support area for canopy. The uh, 20 acres, now it used to be 20 plus acres, but now it's just the 20 to 39.99 acres is 10,000 square feet of mature canopy, 9,000 support, 4,950 square feet of that support can be used for canopy. So these are the big changes we have. Um, we upped our tiers and what the square footage of canopy can be. So between 40 acres and 59.99, you can have 20,000 square feet of canopy and 18,000 square feet of support. Now that 55% of your support area being used for uh, canopy only applies to those smaller parcels. So here is just canopy and support separate and distinct. So 60 to 79.99, 30,000 square feet of canopy, 27,000 square feet of support, and then 80 plus acres, 40,000 square feet of canopy, which is just a hair under a full acre, um, and then 36,000 square feet of support. Some additional caveats that are in the ordinance is that regardless of your parcel size, indoor canopy cannot exceed 10,000 square feet. Um, and that's, again, if you have a hundred acre parcel, the most you can do for indoor is 10,000 square feet. And that's not to say you can't have it mixed. You could do a combination of outdoor mixed light and indoor, it's just the indoor cannot exceed 10,000. And mixed light shall not exceed 20,000 square feet. Now, there is a little bit of a mismatch between the county's definition of mixed light and the state. So the, the big differentiation there between the county's definition is that it includes light deprivation. So if you have light deprivation on any of your hoops, the county considers that mixed light. Now for um, the setbacks, we've differentiated between external and internal setbacks. So external, again, being the outside, touching anything that's not yours, part of your premises. Um, it has remained the same for the up to 10,000 square feet. You need a hundred foot setback. 
anywhere between the 10,000 to 20,000 square feet of canopy. It's 150 foot setback. And then the 20 to 40,000 is 200 foot setback. Um, so if you're looking to expand, you already have a permitted cultivation site and say you have 10,000 square feet, but you have 40 acres. Now you want to expand. That doesn't mean that existing 10,000 now has to be 150 feet. That existing canopy is legal and conforming to what you had at the time. It just means anything new has to meet that new requirement. And then an internal setback. So for instance, a shared property line under common ownership or control, which is part of your permitting process. Um, indoor mixed light, you just have to meet the zoning setbacks for buildings, which is typically 30 feet. Um, and then if you have outdoor, uh, it can straddle, it can go right on that uh, property line. Um, again, if it doesn't involve any structures, if it's just straight outdoor cultivation, again, no setback. So moving on to one of the other big changes, is it used to be a thousand foot setback from sensitive sites. Sensitive sites is defined right there. Uh, school, church, park, child, daycare center, youth oriented facility. That has now been reduced to 600 feet. Um, still a thousand foot setback from state and federal parks. Um, but again, that can be reduced if certain criteria is met. Now, some of the other big changes um, where a lot of the questions are probably gonna come in here is the additional license types that we're now allowing. So in addition to cultivation, the county now allows distribution, um, not just self-distribution, but type 11. Some of the caveats to that are that it's a maximum of six vehicle trips per day, and that only a thousand or up to 1,000 square feet of your support area can be dedicated to excuse me, distribution. Um, that's not in addition to your support area, that is part of your support area. So non-volatile manufacturing or the type six license, again, only a maximum of 1,000 square feet of your allowed support area can be dedicated to this. For the micro business or type 12 license, you're required to have your cultivation um, and at least two of the following at one location or premises, which is manufacturing, distribution and retail. Now for the county to allow retail, it has to be part of the micro business. It can't be a standalone or it can't be just cultivation and retail. It has to be part of the micro business. Now two parts of that retail or are non-storefront or delivery. And that is applied for through an ADP. So similar to the cultivation. Uh, the bigger obstacle here is the storefront retail, which requires a use permit. Um, and the use permit is a little more involved. It does involve a public hearing. Um, adjacent parcels are notified of that hearing and allowed to give public comment. Um, actually, anybody can give public comment, but adjacent parcels are notified of that specifically. It's a higher threshold for that, and that's because you're inviting the public out to your property, to your land. So it has to meet another tier of requirements, safety requirements, fire requirements um, for that, just because again, you're bringing the public out there. Uh, additional thing I wanted to throw out there is one of the ordinance changes addresses uh, CCNRs. So codes, covenants and restrictions that the property owner is solely responsible to make sure they comply with that. So if you're looking to buy property, um, just be aware of those as it may have restrictions on what you can do um, commercially. So for the ADP, um, again, the planning department has always been lead on a, these ADPs. Um, it's an administrative review process. It's easier than a use permit. Uh, the current cost of that is um, just under $2,200. And we used to have a cannabis cultivation permit, which was for the smaller uh, cultivation up to 2,500 square feet, but we've done away with that now just to simplify. Um, everything is now handled as an ADP. So we no longer have that CCP. 
So again, this nothing has changed here. This is the general process for the administrative development permit um, that once a complete submittal has been received, uh, it's routed to all the various agencies within CDA and fire. The review time is 30 to 45 days, although it, it's closer to that 30 days now. Um, and then we give you notification if there's any Incom any incomplete items or items that need clarification. Um, the resubmittals are reviewed within 30 days. And then once we have everything we need, and then conditions of approval are sent to the applicant and the ADP is finalized. Now, moving on to the amendments. So if you have existing cultivation, you wanna take advantage of these changes to the ordinance. Um, it's going to be very similar to that original application. Um, it will be an ADP application, uh, but you're only including the information being changed. Um, so keep in mind any change to layout um, of your canopy or support area, that's going to require an amendment, um, which then entails updated site plans. And the amendments are, are similar to um, the time frame for incomplete items or corrections. It's a 30 day review period for those amendments. So it will move a little bit faster than your original ADP application. Um, along with that ADP, um, some of you may be familiar with is the annual cannabis permit. It's automatically created when you apply for your ADP. Um, so think of your ADP as your application and then the ACP or annual cannabis permit as your, your annual renewal. Uh, current cost for that is um, $936 and some change. Um, of course, with inflation that goes up a little bit every year, but it's still fairly nominal. And as far as I know, we're the cheapest in the state. Um, one thing that has changed is with the annual renewal, um, it is routed to each individual department for review of those conditions of approval that you are given on your ADP. So some of those conditions of approval can be recurring items such as a management plan um, that might need updates annually, or in some cases, those conditions may uh, coincide with environmental health and having to renew a contract for a portable uh, ADA toilet, something like that. So they'll review those, make sure that they got everything they need, or for instance, ag. Um, the ag department will wanna make sure you're up to date on your scales, your pesticide training. So each individual department will review that and make sure you're complying with those conditions before that ACP gets issued. Once it's issued, then you will contact the cannabis compliance and we'll come out, myself, Thomas or Ricky, will come out and do that inspection for you. Thomas, you want to take the canopy? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Jay. Um, so this canopy, uh, these canopy slides, uh, most everybody in here is familiar with this. Uh, this is a slide from last time, and you know we're not currently making any uh, additional changes to how we are uh, measuring support area. So just you know, keep in mind clearly define the support areas. Uh, a lot of you in here we've worked directly with on this. Interior walls, shelves, greenhouse walls, um, just have that canopy area screened or if it's from a public right of way, have it fenced, you know, for our security requirements. Um, and just as easy as you can um, make it for us to get in, make those initial measurements, ensure your canopies area is uh, correct. Um, often we see like T-posts, wood posts, et cetera, identifying the canopy area is also something you guys are trellising off of. So um, you guys have been doing great and um, no real changes there. So, you know, as Jay covered earlier, is if you do intend to utilize that 55% of your support area as canopy, please, you know, update your site plans, identify that as canopy area, uh, as mature flower. Um, so we know it's in there and we can calculate that. So your support area, as always, is still limited to the 90% of the canopy area. As we covered earlier, the 55% of support area can be utilized. Now this is only applying to those 39.99 uh, acres under the 40s. 
So, you know, the intent of this was um, to give people that are on smaller parcels, uh, you know, ability to get out more canopy, more flowering um, area uh, while still remaining compliant with our CEQA. Um, yeah, so just keep those activities, the drying, curling, trimming, grading, etc. Everything everybody's used to and is standard practice in Nevada County. Um, uh, let's see the next slide, Jay. So just for clarification, if you are using a structure or support area, just go ahead and give us those um, square footages and what intent you do in that building so we could isolate. This is support. This may not be considered support. And now here is a another example of that 55%. So just if you're, say you have, um, a lot of you out there may have an existing hoop house that you're utilizing for immature plants and you want to use that to get some mature flower out of, um, go ahead and just throw in that canopy area in your site diagram and um, that's all we'll need. So the question and answers, I know we have a lot of continuing applicants that look like their amendments. I see some of our consultants, our professional engineers, um, you know, we will try to fill in any questions. Your questions are often uh, new and very creative. So we'll adapt as possible and try to give you a as clear answer. And of course, you know, Jason and I and Ricky, um, you know, we're always uh, available uh, via email to get you that. And we prefer getting you that rather than over the phone in writing. So uh, one, you could hold us accountable and two, you have it to show either your uh, partners or consultants, your applicants. Thanks so much, guys. And I want to encourage it, Thomas and Jason, if each of you want to maybe uh, put your email address into the chat for folks. Um, and everybody on the call, please feel free to type questions into the chat or into the Q&A function. Um, these webinars are what you make of them. So the more you engage, the more we all get out of it. Um, our um, question. I just want to add something uh, clarifying. Uh, uh, something for everybody, uh, which is that as it relates to retail for the non storefront and the storefront retail on the farm, the intent is for that to be product that is that can be sold is product that has been grown within Nevada County. So this actually mimics um, existing regulations for farm stands and things like that that exist where it's, it, so these are not these, these the intent is for these to be more of like a winery model or if it's a delivery it could be like a CSA something like that. Um, these are not meant to be full on retail opportunities. This upcoming year, uh, we are working with the county on a more robust retail ordinance for what we think of as a traditional dispensary model. Um, so just wanted to make make everybody aware of that as they're, you know, if, if people are considering the non storefront or the storefront retail. Yeah, and I just I just like to just follow that up is, you know, what we would like is, you know, everybody's trying to support Nevada County cannabis. We'd like you guys to support each other. You know, if somebody's closer to Grass Valley or Nevada City that doesn't have the development um, hindrances, let's just say that somebody out in North San Juan or, you know, in another isolated location, I don't know, it's Perimeter Road or something. This is your opportunity to support each other. You know, you may focus in flower, they may have uh, some extraction. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's support each other um, ongoing. Okay, so our first question we have here um, says, so if you have hoops and no lights and only pull tarps, that will still count in the county as mixed light as opposed to as in the state reclassifying hoops with no lights as outdoor? Can you please clarify? Yeah, sure, I'll take this one, Thomas. Um, we've actually had that question a number of times and it's just that mismatch between the county and state definition. So when you're applying with the county, it'll be called, so for instance, hoops with blackout tarps. Um, for county purposes, it's going to be called mixed light, but you can still maintain that outdoor license with the state. So the ordinance says the appropriate license. It does mean because the county calls it mixed light, you have to have a mixed light license with the state. It just has to match the state's definition and be appropriate for that. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, thanks, Jay. And I just like to mention that the state decided to um, change this and adopt it while our draft and everything was already circulated. So um, timing was also problematic on that, but we understand the question and, and your concern and the inconsistency that you would see. Thanks for that clarification. Uh, the next question here is, what is the current cost of filing an amendment? I believe it's the same cost as the uh, ADP application. And can you reiterate what that is? So that is the, yeah. I'll, I'll double check on uh, um, the amendment cost while you're. Yeah, so I believe that's a 2,180. Uh, just to clear, just to follow up on that, is that what, if a building permit is being amended or something, is it the same cost or is this, that seems really high. Has it always been that much? Um, within um, a, a small percentage for inflation, yeah, the, the cost for an ADP has always been around there. It's a little bit cost. Like if you're doing an amendment, like if you're just changing your floor plan, you know, your out your um if you're just changing your, you know, canopy layout and your, you know, your um your application doesn't have to be circulated to all the departments, it does have to go to environmental health or something like that. Is it still the same cost? So that that may depend on what the amendment is. Um again, depending if it it doesn't need to go to every department because that cost for the ADP application is based on the review from all those departments. So I would have to actually get with Jessica, who is not here right at the moment. Um, but I can I can follow up with some clarification for okay. that because if it doesn't need to be routed to every department, um, that may affect the overall yeah. cost. I, I understand what you're saying. Sweet. Yeah, I'll, I'll also, uh, while we're in this Jason's kind of question, I'll double check on that. Um, it's not the same price as a building permit. And if something is uh, a simple site plan change out or if you're doing the 55% increase, like Jason said, staff time may be significantly lower than that in their building. So uh, that's, a, that's a planning question uh, as to their fee ordinance, but we'll get an answer before we leave today. Thank you. Okay, um, next question. and. Uh, some of the consultants said that they have experienced lower costs for um, smaller amendments. Um, next question is, what is the process for applying for the micro business license, particularly for the non storefront retail license? Thomas, do you want to take this one? Yeah, um, we're trying to make this as simple as possible. And um, if we're just going to handle everything through an ADP amendment, we're not creating an additional um, fee or a process or anything if you're going to change, you know, a license type. Um, we're going to run, you know, your proposal and the review of your, you know, the ping from the state that we get for your license type, just as we currently do. Um, we're we're trying to just get these ordinance changes to be a benefit with no additional um, costs or anything um, above what we're used to in our program. And then uh, at the end of this, when we talk about grants, I'll uh, add how we can help you with that also. Great. Um, the next question we have is, if we have nine acres, and a 2,500 square foot license currently, and we want to utilize a thousand square feet of support area for canopy. Is will this be allowed? Um, good evening, Ron. Yes, it will. So you can absolutely use a thousand square feet um, of your support area for mature canopy. Um, now that's not an additional amount. Um, but you can use a thousand square feet. And if your original application, you only had, for instance, 500 square feet and you wanted to take advantage of more of that, um, then it would be an amendment to add additional support area, which you could then use to maximize um, that 55% of your support area for mature canopy. Mm -hmm. So um, again, to answer your question, Ron, yes, you can absolutely do that. Great. 
I just want to encourage people to type in to the chat or to the Q&A any questions that are coming up for folks. Um, the next question I have is um, somebody, if I have a 16 acre parcel um, and next door, the adjacent parcel next door is four acres and it's for sale. Um, if I wanted to purchase this to expand from my 5,000 to 15,000, does that work? Um, so yes, part of the, the ordinance change too is allows for um, the aggregate between the two parcels instead of just going with the largest. Um, so you can, the 16 and a four acre, you're now bumped up to that 20 acre. So you could do the increase canopy up to the 10,000 square feet. Was there a parcel like minimum size that had to be used in that? No, okay. I don't believe so. I believe there's a reference to a five acre minimum. Yeah. Let me look into that. Um, and also I just wanted to, as it relates to the topic of using our using canopy for um, additional um, square footage, just, just a reminder to everybody that in addition to getting the local amendment and the approval locally, to do that, uh, everyone also needs to um, get a state license to reflect that additional mature canopy. So that's really uh, that's really important. And um, you know, if people have questions about that, we can we can certainly help us assist, assist with that. But everyone should also know that the process with the state is taking kind of a long time. Um, could be up to six months, uh, maybe even more. So just just make just just want everybody to be aware of that that it is a dual license local permit state license to reflect your entire mature canopy and um diana yeah think thanks for pointing out that minimum size so um i will correct myself it is a minimum of five acres so if you were to have um 16 acres or, or 15 acres then a, at least a minimum five acre adjacent parcel then you could use that aggregate to pump you up but it must be a minimum of five acres thank you for clarification um and being told the chat is disabled i apologize for that but the q a is working just fine um so the next um and this sort of tags on to what diana just mentioned um the next question is in order to change your license type with the county does it have to be approved first with the state So um, let me let me clear or go ahead, Jay. I was I was gonna ask for a little bit of clarification, but go ahead. No, go for it. I was just gonna say um it it, it kind of depends on what it is you're you're changing to. Um typically if you're going down or you had mixed light and now you realize you can qualify for the state definition of outdoor, um it, it's much easier kind of downgrading, so to speak, than upgrading. So if you're outdoor and you want to go mixed light, typically we would ask that you're at least in the process or can prove that you're in the process of upgrading with the state um, while we allow that. But if you're going the other way from mixed light to say outdoor, um, you're for one paying for more expensive license with more requirements. So to go the other way, it's actually less restrictive. Um, but if you're going the other way, we at least ask for for some kind of indication that you're in the process of changing that license with the state and we should get that ping as well yeah any any anything to that's you know right and reasonable to keep you know this is cultivation right this is farming so to keep you guys active and moving um with your plans for increasing would be a benefit and i just want to get some uh clarification so the amendment is actually um coming out to $480.94 for original submittal. That is a, a billable hours of one hour of cannabis, two hours of planning review. However, um, if it needs to be routed to um, EH, to public works or anything like that, you know, I would identify that you need to plan for, um, you know, additional invoices, time review by those um, divisions. So again, trying to be approachable, keep the cost. If we keep you know, the review down quickly, get it out in the 30 days and uh, get you guys going. 
just anticipate slightly higher, but um, for that original submittal of the application for 8094. Thanks so much for that clarification. And just a clarification on the pr the prior question about the county changing county um, and state licensing. Uh, sh she meant more of change in canopy, increasing canopy size, um, distribution, and transport. Okay. Yeah. So in that sense, too. Yeah, you would you would need to have that appropriate license with the state um, as a condition for approval for that that increase with us as well. So just like the original application, we're looking for that state license to match. Great, so the next question we have here, um, when we add the additional mature canopy and 55% of support area, but nothing else changes with the project, are we correct in assuming that it's an amendment process, not an entirely new application? That is correct. It's an amendment. For further clarification on that, the amendment process is filling out the same ADP application, but only including the new information. Correct. And in the case of changing um, support or identifying support that you want to use for mature canopy, um, it's really just, I think, a single page describing what you're doing and then a site plan update. So it's as simple as, it should be as simple as that. Yeah, just to further clarify, it's it's a separate application referred to as an amendment application that is, I think at the most it's two pages long. It's a basic narrative. You fill out what you're doing and you provide the supportive documents. So no need to go through that whole long uh, original ADP packet that you originally uh, submitted. That two page document you just referenced, is that available on the county's website or do people need to contact you to uh, get that? It is, it is on the county website, but um, I'll try to throw it in the uh, chat or Q&A right now. Great, thanks. Um, okay, next question, we have a follow up from Ron. Um, hi, Ron. Of course, I was asking essentially is with a 2,500 square foot license on nine acres, is adding a thousand feet, which would make it 3,500 square feet, will this be allowed on nine acres? Because now we are limited to 2,500 with our acreage. Yes. So that would boost you up to 3,500. Um, square feet of canopy and that is allowed. So that support is in addition to um, your 2,500 square feet of canopy. So it's it's above and beyond that and you're still completely legal and safe with the county by doing that. So that 55% of support is in addition to your maximum allowed canopy. So that would push you up over the 2,500 square feet, 5,000, 10,000, um, and you're still Good. Great. Next question. In regards to a micro business license, do we need to apply for a state license as well? Yes. Um, and in fact, it, it's the, the state license that we're, we're mimicking in our ordinance for that micro business license. So again, for the county, it has to include cultivation plus at least two others of either distribution, non-volatile manufacturing, um, and or retail. Great. Next. Yeah. Uh, let me just add something. And so for you uh, applicants and the consultants and professionals out there, um, you know, keep in mind what the DCC is taking to review those and, and timing, you know, maybe try to get a, a feel of how long the state's taking it for us. Uh, I think nowadays, if you submit an amendment, uh, we're going to probably beat the state, uh, but we're also going to need that ping from the state. So, uh, you know, timing, it always comes down to the importance of timing. So just please keep that in mind. I wouldn't suggest submitting them both on the same day because we'll probably wildly, you know, um, approve it before the state. 
Um, but what I'll also throw in there is you can continue to cultivate and use what you have been approved for. It's just that addition that you'll have to wait on um, before you get the approval to use. So you can still cultivate what you were previously approved for. Great. Um, and yes, we welcome all follow-up questions from everybody. Uh, you can keep the questions coming. Um, the next question we have is, what is the difference between storefront and non-storefront? And where are these allowed within the county and not allowed within the county? All right, so the difference between the storefront and non-storefront, think of storefront as your traditional retail. You're going to a store um, where the public is coming to your property, to your land, to purchase a product. Um, the non-storefront, think of that as delivery, delivery only. So you don't have the public coming to your property. And where these are allowed are essentially anywhere that your cultivation would be allowed. I will say with a caveat though, um, that the non-storefront or the delivery, again, that, that goes through the same process as cultivation. It's an ADP um, application. If you're going to have a storefront where the public comes out, that requires a different type of application process with a planning department. That's a use permit. So the use permit has more extensive requirements. The use permit is now where the public gets to have a hearing um, and express their opinions for or against. So it is a little bit more of an open process. Um, and there is a potential if, if the neighbors are very against it. Now, that's not to say just because somebody's against it doesn't mean it won't be approved, um, but that is an additional requirement to prepare for that you don't if you're doing delivery only. And just to follow up on that, it's just that reminder of what I said earlier in our webinar, which is that these are not traditional delivery and storefront retails like, like we think about. Um, these really are meant to be more um, farm bait or they are farm based. So again, if it's a delivery model, it's not going to look like a traditional delivery model you see in more of an urban area um, where you're delivering a bunch of products and you're going to and from your farm. Like that's 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 not that's not what it looks like. There's still a restriction of only six vehicle trips a day, and you can still only um, sell your product or product road in Nevada County. So what that could look like is maybe a CSA community supported agriculture type model. Um, and then for that, that, that storefront retail, again, it's more of like a winery type model with how it's set up on our rural lands. And we will be working on the, the more traditional retail model this, this upcoming year. Um, yeah, so just, just that, just to make sure that that's in people's minds, they're considering various business plans. And another uh, follow-up question, Jason, on the CUP process that you mentioned, does that come to a vote? Is that something that um, it is voted on or, or how does that take place at the county level at the end? That is a question for planning. I do not know how that comes down. Um, I'll have to get back to you on that. Thanks. Um, Next question. Um, so following up again, if you are, say I am uh, wanting to use additional squ square footage and add to my mature canopy, if I had a state license that had been um, the small specialty cottage license for 2,500 square feet, and now with the county's new rules, I can cultivate up to 3,500 square feet do I now need to get a different state license for the state's 5,000 square feet of canopy license since I'm ex going beyond my state license, which allows 2,500 square feet? Thomas, do you have an answer for that one? Yeah, you're always going to be, you're going to want to be consistent with the state, right? This is another thing where we don't exactly align our definitions and what we identify, but you would want to ensure that the amount of flower you have on site, mature flower is consistent with your state license. So that, oh, sorry. That could look like either if you're 
renewal for your state license times up appropriately, you could renew at a larger license type. So the 5,000 square foot license type, the larger license type, or if your renewal is not for many, many months, you could get the next, you could, get, you could have your existing 2,500 square foot license type and then get an additional 2,500 square foot license type. Um, and then when it's time for your next renewal, kind of convert them together. So um, it's kind of a game of when your renewal is going to be, but exactly what Thomas said, you just have to make sure that your mature canopy is covered in one of those ways uh, with the state license. Um, a question, the state might require a storage building for non-storefront delivery, question mark? I... So for that, um, I don't know what the requirements are for the state for that. I believe they do require an area for storage um, for distribution. I, I don't know the exact specifications, but the county, um, if you're to do the distribution type 11 license, um, you can only use up to a thousand square feet of your support area for that. Um, I don't know what the state's requirements are for size. And there are definitely people are interested in the non storefront delivery or distribution or even manufacturing or you know whatever the uh, you know additional license type is. Um, reach out to us here at the Alliance, and we can send to you the exact state code related to that license type, so the requirements by the state, because there's some very very specific requirements. Um, from the state for security, um, various areas for storage holds and uh, secured areas, um, video uh, surveillance, so uh, insurance requirements, et cetera, but specifically related to the building, there's definitely some requirements that you want to be aware of at the very start of this process. Um, it's not it's, it's not as simple as just you know, putting up an ad building and being able to do it. Um, and then at the local level, there are also very specific building requirements that one would need if they did want to get a, 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 one of these license types and they don't already have an existing conforming building. So your building would have to be conformed to um, F1 building standards um, and there's some road standards as well. So just, just reach out to us here at the Alliance or of course reach out to the county um, to understand best what some of those specifics are. Thanks for that. Um, and this is actually a follow up on a previous comment or statement of yours, Diana, um, for renewing state licenses, just for clarification, if it is on your, your already existing renewal schedule, you can renew for a different license size without applying for a new license. Is that correct in what you said? Diana. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we repeat that. I was I was reading. Uh, what did you say? Just this was a follow up question on what you said about state license renewals. That if you are renewing on your existing renewal schedule and just renewing for a different size license, that you do not have to apply for a new license. You can just they'll just renew it for a different size. No, you do. You need to uh, at your renewal. You would need to then, uh, to my understanding, if you're changing to an, like a larger license type, you'd actually have to get a brand new, uh, submit a brand new permit for that license type, but you just want to match it up with when your renewal is so you're not paying additional fees. But it's not as, at the state level, it's not as simple as just adding additional canopy. You actually, um, from, from my understanding, you actually have to go through the permit process, uh, the application process again. Now, if you have all of your documents from your original submittal, it should be relatively simple. Um, it, you know, you're just submitting your, your new site plan. Um, but you, yeah, that's, that's how, that's from my understanding how the process works at the state level, but you do want to time it with your renewal. So you're not paying additional fees and, and can add like complications if you have, um, multiple licenses. Thanks for that clarification. Um, okay, next question. I'd like to get a bit more clarification on an earlier comment regarding the difference between the state and county's outdoor mixed light um, license, how those are being classified now. 
Um, was it said that you can do an outdoor license on, with the state, but with the county, you will have to submit it as mixed light if you are using light deprivation? Is that correct? Um, that is correct. And so it, it's more semantics. Um, the planning department wants to see the description as mixed light. And if we see it's light dap, no electrical, no artificial lighting, then myself as the inspector, we're just gonna look that they have an appropriate corresponding license. So if you have the outdoor license with the state, that's great. It's just, they wanna see, the planning department wants to see mixed light as the description on the site plan submitted with the county. And just to offer clarification, because I, I was concerned about you know the inconsistency um, during scientific review or something like that with the DCC. And I reached out to the DCC. I informed them of um, how they're not quite aligning. Um, they're fully aware. Uh, they discussed it at a uh, staff meeting and um, didn't present any challenges. Great, thanks. Um, the next question, on the 55% increased canopy size, do you still have to deduct the support areas of a building from the increased canopy size? For example, we have a 24 by 60 processing building and want to know if that is deducted from the increased canopy on the 55%. Okay, I think it's an easy answer. I'm just getting caught caught up in the uh, clarification. The <laughs> yeah, um, you know, your total support is going to be your total support at the ninety percent. The fifty five is going to be fifty five percent of that. So you may end up if you do try to utilize that full fifty five percent, and you're thrown over. We would look for you to reduce support activities in another location. Now, if that's within a structure or something, you could work with our team uh, to identify like how we can, you know, call that portion out of bounds if that helps. Yeah, I think there, there's there been, I've received a lot of questions needing clarification just about like, if I in that clear redundant clarification of, you know, if I'm gonna be using this more space and mature canopy, you know, won't I need the same amount of increased support area, but that the support area is not fluctuating with that necessarily. That's, I think, where a lot of people are getting caught up. Yeah, so the new allowance of mature flower doesn't add to what would be identified as your canopy area of which your support area is calculated off of. We can work it out. Feel free to contact us. We can, we can work it out. I think we know what you're going for, and um, I don't think we're going to get there, but we'll help you in some other way. We'll find yeah. it. We'll always I, find I, it. I think the best way to say it is your support area is your support area. That does not increase whatsoever, but you can use a portion of that support now for your mature can in addition to your mature canopy, but support will never increase beyond that um, maximum allowed. Great, thanks. Um, next question. The ACP doesn't differentiate, does it? For example, we have a 10,000 square foot license. We use 7,500 square foot of outdoor and 25 square foot, 2,500 square feet of ML tier one. Um, yeah. That is correct. Your ACP or your annual cannabis permit that's just your annual renewal. That that's your permit, um, and it's just to show that you're still in compliance. Um, it it all matters in, with your initial ADP. That's your application, and then your annual renewal. If you're not changing anything, the, the ACP it doesn't matter if indoor, outdoor, mixed light, um, or any combination thereof. And and since we're on the subject of ACPs. I just want to let um, everybody know that we currently have modified our ACP process and with the goal of streamlining uh, the review, you know, as you know, Canvas Compliance and your local fire agency and our uh, Deputy Fire Marshal Scott Ekman 
you know, we do these site inspections and often it is difficult coordinating everybody to get out. So um, Jason referred to it earlier. There's now a review process for the ACP. The ACP is going to look different. It's not going to have all these uh, signatures with different dates from different agencies, you know, coming out. So that goal is to alleviate, you know, you guys from having to have that complex scheduling staff and just streamline the process for everybody. Does that mean, Thomas, that um, uh, uh, CDA staff can do the fire uh, inspection? I know it, it sometimes it, it happens, but is that what that means? Yeah, yeah, no, your local fire and the Cal Fire representative, they're still going to do what they believe they need to do as appropriate. It's just, you know, um, I, I don't want to speak to what they will deem appropriate site visits wise, et cetera, but it will be a internal routing of checkoffs and approvals. No more getting that piece of paper. You know, we've had those two ACPs and getting everybody's signatures on each one. It, it turned out to be um, problematic. So we're trying to just streamline the applicant and the fire agencies and staff time. Um, just, uh, you know, we started with, Congratulations, you have a cannabis program, get started. And, we, you know, we created a process and what we're trying to do with these ordinance changes, with the ACP modifications, with the grants coming up, we're just trying to make everybody's ability to cultivate easier. Thank you. You guys, are, we're so grateful. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, Tessa, I'm going to ask you a question because redundancy is helpful for all of us sometimes. Um, and if one person has it, many people have the same question. Um, for the addition of cultivation, distribution, manufacturing, and or retail non-storefront, the micro-business license, essentially, um, will the updated ADP sitemap need to reflect each licensed premises as it relates to the regulations set forth by the state? Um, does this make sense? Sort of we will we just need to designate each of those licensed premises as it relates to the state regs and then update our support areas for each of those licensed premises? I, I, uh, no, go ahead. Okay, so clarification is key, right? Um, and we all know that we still have inconsistent site plans with the state and whatnot, right? This is what the state considers a premises. We, we've, this is kind of continuing from the beginning of our program. All I can identify, this is new, label and identify. And that's all we're going to ask is, is if you make it clear, just like what we ask, what activity is going on inside of the support building, just go ahead and say that's where you're running your distro and your mobile distro, like so uh, mobile sales. So um, just clarification, it, it, just annotation, just, and if you're in doubt, just let us know so we don't have to um, follow up. Great, thanks for that. Um, next question we have, if using a neighboring parcel to expand a current garden, one that is not under common ownership, what type of authorization is needed from that property owner? Um, does a lease, is a lease sufficient? Um, if so, and the new canopy and all associated support areas are going to be located on the current parcel being grown on and there's no activity on the newly leased land, does any information about the leased land have to be submitted to the state or to the county in the ADP amendment and new state license process? There's there's a there's a lot in there. I'd say reach out to both of us, but um, common ownership and control is kind of the key, right? So at least means you control the parcel. I believe we have a situation where we have an an applicant who is a landowner and who has common ownership and control and a lease over an adjacent parcel, and uh, you know that is consistent. Uh, we're not trying to hang up or get anything, anybody complicated. We want to ensure that you have control of that. You have the ability to uh, operate on that with the landowner's permission. You know, we have a lot of people who have leases on parcels. Um, 
nothing inconsistent there, right? You own your parcel, you're leasing the next door. We're looking to make it clear and straightforward. So um, the ordinance states common ownership or control. So a lease is that control. Um, and what you would need to submit with that amendment is a copy of that lease showing that you have control um, of that parcel. And then as far as the information that you need to supply is which parcel that is, um, you know, which parcel you're using, that would then be part of your uh, site plan. It would have to be included with that. Um, because again, we need to identify what it is, even if it's all entirely on one parcel and you're just using that for the increased acreage. Great, thanks for that. Um, just one follow-up to that. If I say I am the person who is leasing my property out to a license holder to utilize, um, in, in addition to the lease agreement that I've set up with that person, do you does this process require any other of uh, my information, um, or do can I? I don't need to be involved at all at that point. Uh, we could follow up with that, um, but if you remember your original ADP, there's a there's an applicant, a responsible party, a property owner. Uh, so if we're doing an amendment, I would want to ensure that we have a place of identifying the property owner on that to be just consistent with another lease. But um, I think you might have just identified um, something we might need to update. Great. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if planning has a way of handling that right now, but when I think of the original ADP process, there is a way of identifying that individual with the lease um, in addition. So. Um, I'd have to get clarification on that one. It's a good question. Great, thanks. Um, okay, one more, we have one more follow-up question here. Thanks everybody for sticking with us. Um, a little more further clarification, please. Can you please clarify why the county is deducting support structure square footage if the structure is not being used for any cultivation purposes? I don't understand the question um, in, I, in regard. Oh, go ahead. I'll, I'll go on. I, I think I understand the question, but I go ahead, Jason. If, if it's related to using um, support area for additional mature canopy, then again, that goes back to the you're only allowed so much for support. And then you can use some of that support for additional mature canopy, but that's why we deduct that area from your support. It's part of your support. So you're not increasing the total amount. Otherwise, if it's not used for cultivation purposes, then we wouldn't. Maybe I'm, tell me if this is off base, but I a lot of this goes back to our CEQA document and we're very limited in the amount. Like we only have that, that box for support area, which is 90% of our canopy. And so how we divide up that box is sort of the, the puzzle that we're all trying to do if we are you know, expanding or growing mature canopy or if we're gonna do distribution in there, it's kind of what we do with that 90%, but it all, that 90% all relates back to our CEQA document um, and our, yeah, our environmental document. Yeah, it's it's a it's a finite pie, right? We could slice that thing up, but let's not get outside. You can reach out to Jason and I. We'll find a solution. If you're if you're up against some square footage issues or something, let us know. You know, sometimes outside eyes um, give us something to think creatively about. Um, but just consider that, yeah, that finite number, and let's divide it up, but still remain within. Yeah, and, and in some cases, too, we have folks that are not utilizing their full 90%. So um, you can add, if, if you haven't used that full 90%, you can add support area. And then that way, if you have a manufacturing building or, or where you're drying and you want additional canopy, but you don't want to reduce that drying area, you can, in some cases, increase your overall support as long as you haven't hit that 90%. So there is that possibility as well, because some people, maybe they only have 500 square feet of support and they can't give that up for canopy well you can increase that support area in that particular case 
That's great. Thanks so much for elaborating on all of that. Um, if there's any last questions, now is the time. Um, I want to remind everybody that this has been recorded. If you know people that this information would be helpful for, please suggest that they tune in and listen to the recording. It will be available on our through our website and on our YouTube playlist uh, by next week. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much, Thomas and Jason, for your time and all of your work to make everybody in this program's life more streamlined through these processes. We are very fortunate to have you guys um, in collaboration with the industry. Um, I want to uh, encourage everybody on the call to stay engaged and to tune in next month, April 6th, to the next Get Legit webinar on workplace safety and compliance, um, especially if you have any employees, um, OSHA and things like that are requirements and really important for you to be aware of. Um, and I also want to just encourage everybody to reach out if there are other areas that you need support in or just need somebody to talk to about things, we are here for you. Um, if you are not a member of the Alliance, please consider becoming a member and joining the effort. Um, and Matt, sorry, I, I wanna make sure uh, we got another big announcement from Thomas too. Um, yeah. Yeah, after you're wrapped up, Maggie, uh, I'll add something. Go ahead, guys, everybody. Okay, I, uh, I just before we get too far down the road and if people drop off, I want to talk about the new exciting fun stuff, right? The grants. I want to talk about the grant opportunities that we have uh, coming up. Is now a good time or do you want me to hold off, Maggie? Now is great. Okay, so, um, you know, the cannabis division with some uh, CDA staff and some uh, encouragement from our CAO's office and assistance. Uh, we have applied for a DCC grant uh, last year and a half ago, I believe it was. And then just as recently, uh, a cannabis equity grant with uh, GoBiz, the off governor's office of economic development. Um, we have successfully received both those uh, grants. So we will be working with Sierra Business Council uh, to distribute those funds. And we will have, uh, we'll be setting up our equity program and we'll have actually, um, you know, criteria for equity applicants. We are setting that criteria to appropriately address our applicants and people interested in cultivating in Nevada County. And then we have uh, the other DCC funds, which is a slightly uh, different requirement. So we're hoping with those two different programs, we could assist um, hopefully as many of you as we can. And we're, we're excited about it, you know, with the state doing equity uh, waivers, license fee waivers, uh, with this new grant opportunity for you guys in Nevada County. Um, you know, we're hoping to make everything easier and hopefully cost your these amendments that are potentially upcoming that you're thinking about associated costs, application fees, licensing fees, infrastructure. Uh, we want, yeah, yeah, we want to be able to any professional services, your um, your biological studies, your annuals. Like we want to help with that. So. Um, we will do a, you know, we're currently the board two Tuesdays ago, I believe, uh, allowed us to accept those funds. We're in the process of signing the contracts with the state and going through that. So uh, once we do secure those fundings and the contracts are completed, we'll be doing announcements. Um, you know, the county will do announcements on their website. We'll announce it to all our applicants that we have email contacts for. We'll do social media announcements and we'll be holding workshops, um, you know, a workshop, get everybody in like the old days uh, and talk about how we can assist you guys. So we're not quite there yet, but um, it's coming and it's, it's, it's exciting. It's something new for us. And uh, it's an equity program for the county that cannabis has never had before. So um, everybody's encur encouragement, you know, the Alliance, your board of supervisors, um, that's how we got these things done. 
Thanks yeah. so much. Oh, go Jason. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, we, we can't keep this money. It, it's for our cultivators and we want to get it out to you. That's yeah. what it's designated for. It's monumentally exciting. Everybody is really grateful and excited to see this happen. Please know that the Alliance, as well as what Thomas said, the county will be notifying everybody when there is more information available. Um, and we will make sure that everybody understands what is going on with the grants, um, what is available, how to access them. Um, and so stay tuned and stay engaged for um, more information in the coming months on all of those very exciting programs. Um, with that, I would like to wrap up the evening and um, just say thank you again to Thomas and Jason. I really encourage people to reach out if they have site specific questions to the county, reach out to us if we can be of support in any and all ways. Um, and April 6th next month is the next Get Legit webinar. Um, stay tuned for more and we appreciate all of you. Keep up the great work. Um, and we will see you soon. Have a great night, everybody. Stay dry.